Hello, this is a bonus episode of Statistically Insignificant. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and Bart is with me again. How's it going? Hey, I'm good. Um, and no death threats this time. You promise? We'll, we'll save it for next time. I might make a couple. Like, no promises. <laughs> this month is the Soapbox episode, in the sense that I'm going to talk through the theory stuff and then talk about some examples which make me very angry. The topic is mathematical models and their relationship to the real world. Models overall, not just ones done with maths, are a way of representing some structure or system to help us understand and interact with them. These might be presented in words, symbols, diagrams, whatever. A mathematical model is specifically one that represents the system as a mathematical object or a bunch of them, and represents relationships with mathematical formalism. The most common objects are numbers of some description. Counting things is probably the least problematic way to do this, but you can also take measurements like of size, of distance, of time, combine measurements to give more complex metrics. We've talked about a few of these, like CPI, for example, is a combined metric using a whole bunch of different numbers to give you another number but the original stuff is its own kind of thing. There are other weirder objects that get used as well. Uh, I'll point to some of these later on, but if you think of a network of computers, we can represent this with what's called a graph, which, it, it, which is not the graph that you think of, but a bunch of nodes and the connections between them. That's a different kind of mathematical object again. One really common example of a model is a recipe. These use numbers to represent different amounts of stuff, which are usually related to each other in a ratio or proportion of some kind. If you have a recipe for cake, or which is three parts flour, one part sugar and one part milk. Not a great cake, but let's run with it. It doesn't matter what the units are here, so long as the ratio is the same. So you've got a three to one to one flour to sugar to milk sort of combination here. If you use a particular cup or a vessel to measure stuff with, you can do that regardless, so long as it's always the same cup, you will have your recipe work. You can also multiply these. So if you want to double your recipe, you would use six to two to two. You could use the same cup, but you use twice as much of each. The fundamental relationship between the ingredients will still be the same. Concrete also has a recipe. Your basic model is one to two to three. There are other forms of concrete, but this is your uh, simplest one, which is the cement to sand to gravel. And then you have uh, quote unquote enough water to mix them up. We don't really specify the amount of water here because it depends on the humidity and how wet your sand is and other environmental conditions, whether or not you rinsed out your concrete mixer just before and it's got some left in there as well. The mathematical relationship in this case, this one to two to three, is not the whole story. You've also got other stuff going on. A really important point here is that the model is not the system. Your concrete is a physical thing, but the model lives in the fictional universe of maths land and accoutrement and obeys mathematical rules. If you have a model, it's incumbent on the person building it to justify why it is a good representation of its system. We'll come back to that, but I want you to keep it in the back of your head for the next bit. So a more abstract example is what's called the ideal gas law. Uh, this comes up in physics, thermodynamics, and chemistry because it's about you know, the properties of a gas. This relates pressure, volume, and temperature for a given amount of gas in a sealed container, and it is P times V is equal to N times R times T. There's like hidden little multiplications in here, but the physicists don't write those. So P is your pressure, and it's measured in units of pascals. Volume is V, and is measured in units of cubic meters. N is the amount of gas which is measured in units called moles, uh, which is basically a number of molecules that you have. R is what we call the ideal gas constant, and this governs the relationship. It's the number which tells you how this relationship works, and up to two decimal places, it's 8.31. Lastly, we have T, which is the temperature, in degrees Kelvin. The intuition <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> He's hanging around. Super nerdy. <laughs> the intuition here is that as the temperature goes up, if the volume is held constant, the pressure will increase. So think about putting a little candle underneath like your um, a balloon or something, right? That increases 
well, a sealed balloon of some variety, that will incre- increase the pressure inside because all the gas molecules have more energy to bounce around. This is actually the fundamental principle behind steam power, because as the steam heats up, it expands and it creates higher pressure. This is the ideal gas law, because real gas and real vessels containing gas don't behave exactly like this, particularly at low temperatures. Things like heat loss to the environment, thermal expansion of the vessel material, which could change your volume, and energy absorbed by your thermometer will give you slightly different actual measurements to what this describes if you decide to go and test it. Is that deviation from the ideal, is that kind of averaged out, or how is it how is this ideal gas law kind of decided? This is mostly done at higher temperatures because it's more accurate up there. Right. Uh, Yeah, it's it's a bit tricky because you will – anytime you make measurements, you get measurement error and you get stuff going on in the environment. But you can test this across different sorts of gases, uh, different volumes, different temperatures, particularly high temperature, and see the relationship that you get out. And that's how you get this number here. Right. The reason that it behaves like this, why you don't have something like T squared running around or whatever, is actually uh, conservation of energy. Because, like, because energy is conserved, you shouldn't get any more energy out than you put in. So if, for example, you had a non-linear – so this is a linear relationship, uh, as in there is some – this looks like a straight line when you plot, like – uh, temperature against pressure, right? It looks like a straight line yeah, like this. And the slope of that straight line is your 8.31. If it wasn't a straight line, then there would be more energy or less energy hanging around that you'd put in. So that right. the shape of that relationship is defined by the uh, conservation of energy. Yeah. Okay. We can simplify this by taking the V, which is the volume, equal to one meter cubed, and N as equal to one mole, which just means that those go away and we get P equals to RT in this case, because the others are one and multiplying by one doesn't do anything. Yeah. Sorry, that's R, not PT. So this is 8.31 times temperature is equal to pressure. If the temperature increases by one degree Kelvin, the pressure will increase by 8.31 pascals. That's why we have a linear relationship, right? So which means that- If your temperature goes from 20 to 21 degrees Pascal, uh, sorry, degrees Kelvin, not degrees Pascal, then your pressure will go from uh, uh, 20 times 8.31 to 21 (laughs) times 8.31, right? Which is an increase of 8.31. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your one degree difference is, but it can be between 301 Kelvin to 302 Kelvin, or over 1,000 to over 1,000 plus one. It will always have that same pressure difference between the two values. This is most accurate for high temperatures, because if you have your substance at zero degrees Kelvin, then that implies that your pressure is equal to 8.3 times zero, Zero. Yep. Yeah. Theoretically, at absolute zero, you have no pressure. But this is where the idealism comes into play. Real gases under real pressure have a boiling point, which is also the condensing point, right? So this is the temperature at which your gas will condense into a liquid. It's also the temperature at which your liquid will boil and become a gas. There's that phase, that state transition. It's probably going to be higher than zero degrees Kelvin, too. So it's not very realistic to say that this occurs for an actual gas. Yeah. In particular, in a sealed vessel where you hit for a given pressure, that particular like um, boiling point, and it does depend on pressure, as some of your gas condenses, it actually changes the pressure that's going in the vessel. So that fucks with this relationship here. Yeah. As stated, this also doesn't take into account different molecule sizes or how molecules can actually be attracted to each other. So the mathematical model represented here comes with caveats about its relationship to the real world. That's why it's the ideal gas law. It's a pretty good description. It's particularly good at high temperatures, but it's not perfect. It's a mathematical formalism rather than like what actually happens on the ground. Right. Is Pascal named after the... 
the wager with God guy. Yeah, also Not Pascal's God. triangle about guy. God. About God, yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. arguably it's a bet with God as well because you <laughs> like because you have to assume that uh, God does not take belief uh, in self-interest to be contradictory with his values. <laughs> the history of physics' relationship to maths is interesting in this regard because a shitload of maths was invented to describe physical systems. Newton came up with calculus because he wanted to talk about objects in motion, and he set off a centuries-long argument about what it means to have something that is infinitely small in the process. This past century... Quantum mechanics has proven itself very fruitful for the production of new maths, precisely because the way that quantum systems behave didn't look like the mathematical objects that already existed. This also happens in other, chemist in other fields, notably chemistry, but the further you go from physics, the less you see of it. If a physicist tries to tell you that this is because physics is so pure and physicists are snow smart, they're lying. This is because the systems physicists deal with are simple enough that they're amenable to mathematical structures. A hydrogen atom is a hydrogen atom is a hydrogen atom up to ionization, but basically no other field has that luxury. In sociology, I can't pretend that one person is interchangeable with another in the same way that you can say that hydrogen atoms are interchangeable because they just aren't. And if you make that assumption about people, you lose all information about social structure, which is what you're actually interested in. There's just too much going on in a biological or a social system to get a nice, clean mathematical object to describe it. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you can get some principle that you can represent mathematically that describes an amount of variation, but it's never straightforward. That's just a result of the, fe the, the systems that you're interested in. It's not a flaw in the like field. If anything, the willingness to deal with that complexity is a real strength of these other things. Well, and you know, sometimes, sometimes you can. I mean, you you need to find out how many coats are in a <laughs> length of linen and oh, exactly. all sorts of things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the arguably. So, one of the reasons that um, capital is so hard to read is because Marx is basically describing mathematical relationships, and he's trying to do it without using maths and to an audience that he doesn't think will know algebra. So you have to do it all in, in text, and it's impossible to read. I think he's. Uh, I think that's being generous to the great man. I think, he, uh, <laughs> I think he possibly didn't know algebra himself. That's, that's also possible. I want to take a step back now and map out what we're doing. So on the one side, we have the real world. This is what we're trying to describe, what we're trying to understand using our model. On the other side, we have our mathematical model or the mathematical object that we're using to represent the real world. I've already brought up the idea of having good or bad representations, so I'm going to put a dotted line over the top here and write representation up there. To have a good or bad representation, you need to be able to evaluate this connection somehow, preferably quantifiably, but we can also just kind of talk about it. This is where our data and statistics come into play. We understand the real world through observations, so that becomes our data here in the middle. But the data is not the real world, and the data is not the model. So we've got these three separate things. To get data from the real world, we take measurements. And then our mathematical model actually relates to the data in some way. The measurement process here, which we'll get to in a second, the measurement process here really matters, because if you have a bad measurement system, your data won't be a good reflection of the world. Take the sex question from the last Australian census. See episode 3 for more detail on that if you haven't already. This had a completely unscientific classification system of male, female, and quote-unquote non-binary sex. This completely fails to capture the cis or trans dimension of gender, or the experience of intersex people, because the non-binary sex description was only about physiology, and as written, kind of combined both intersex people and trans people who were undergoing some sort of uh, like medical or pharmaceutical or surgery transition. Incredibly insulting, very bad. Overall, just dog shit question. Should not have been done. If you count people based on this system, you get numbers out. Numbers are okay. Counting is okay. But your data sucks because it doesn't represent what people actually experience and how they actually live because your classification system is shit. Another example actually comes from my research on trees. 
I have a size measurement for each tree called diameter at breast height, which is the diameter of a trunk 1.3 metres above the ground. The measurement is done by putting a tape measure around the trunk and converting the length of that, like, circumference to a diameter. There are a few problems with this. Number one, converting the circumference to a diameter is done on the assumption of a circular cross-section. So what I mean by that is, if you have a tree that looks a bit like this, so it's got like this concave bit at the side, then when you put your tape measure around it, let's pretend those are touching and I'm not just shit at drawing, it's going to kind of cut across that concave bit. So it's not going to be running along the actual outside of the tree. It's not like a string or whatever that would... No, it is a string, but it's not like stuck to the tree itself. Right. It, yeah, we, I would call it a convex like circumference, which means that anything that's not convex, so this little bit that goes in here, gets kind of smoothed over. So we're not exactly looking at the circumference here, right? That's a bit of an issue because like your data stops representing the tree quite so precisely. Number two, the conversion to a diameter assumes a circle. So this convex thing is like one limitation. Sorry, I, sh I should say not always a circle. It's not always convex. My bad. Yep, that's how it's spelt and written. <laughs> totally. If you don't have a circle, then you're like, God, I can't. Now here's a question. Can I remember what the conversion is? Yeah, C equal to uh, pi diameter, right? So your circumference is equal to pi, which is a number, times your diameter. So in this case, your diameter is equal to your circumference, which is measured by this blue thing around, divided by pi, right? But if you don't have a circle, for one thing, you no longer have the same diameter everywhere, because in fact, that's how we define a circle. But also, this conversion isn't going to be so exact. So if you have something that looks like an ellipse, right, then you have a minor diameter that th that's that way and a major diameter that's that way. And for the circumference, you'll actually have kind of like less area contained in this than you would expect. That makes this conversion a little bit problematic. Number three, you can have different sizes of tree have the same diameter. What I mean by that is, imagine you have a tree that is like this tall and a tree that is this tall, but they have the same diameter 1.3 meters across ab above the ground. The taller tree is bigger in a very real sense. There's more tree there, but they have the same diameter measurement, which cannot capture that extra dimension. So the data I'm working with is an imperfect representation of these trees. It can still give useful and usable results, so long as I am conscious of those differences, but I have to be careful. And I cannot make claims about you know, trees universally on the assumption of this model. I have to be like really circumspect about what I'm doing. Um, so the height of the trees is not really taken into account? It is not measured in this data because it's a, an awful lot harder to estimate height when you're standing on the ground. Like, there right. are some ways to do it. Like, so if you have your little person standing here, right, you can measure the distance, let's say that distance there, and you can measure that distance there, and you can use, like, Pythagoras' theorem to assume, okay, that's a, a right angle triangle, so I can work out what this height is. Yeah. But you have to be able to point a laser or something at the canopy up here and catch a leaf, and that's going to be variable because you might not always catch the same leaf, or... You'll be at this point of the trunk, but you have branches that come up here. It's it's messy yeah. because you can't so straightforwardly go to the top of the tree and drop a line down and measure the vertical height. Ken was a cherry picker. Not always. Some of these trees <laughs> look. Some of these trees are really fucking tall. Yeah. My data comes from a tropical rainforest, and it has trees that are like I don't know, fifty, hundred meters tall, and places. Yeah. The, I mean, the other consideration here is that like this this data set has something like 400,000 trees in it, and they get measured every five years, and you can't get a cherry picker or anything like that into <laughs> this dense rainforest area. So there's yeah. just no plausible way to get those other measurements. And there are also like more accurate ways, perhaps, to measure the actual like area on the inside of this, which is kind of what we care about. But they require like a lot more intensive resources and a lot of time and manpower and cost, which yeah. makes it not so viable for 400,000 trees. 
we have to think about this gap between the system and data because we can't actually measure that gap directly. Any way we would do so to actually quantify it probably involve like our, another data set. So we have data two down here, which has been measured. And then we're actually comparing data to data two, not data to real world. So you wind up with like problems in trying to do that comparison directly. You can reason about it just as we have here in the shortcomings of this diameter at breast height in relationship to the tree, but I can't so easily go and measure how accurate it is. The relationship between data and model is where we can talk about a good model, because what it means is that the model resembles the data in a useful and meaningful way. Maybe we can use it to predict things too. We actually use statistics to do this. So this is where statistics sits in this modeling system. And if we have two models, so we have a different mathematical model, we have some more stats going between these, then we can compare model one and model two on the basis of their statistics. And we can use actual like goodness of fit statistics is what they're typically called to determine which one is the better representation of the data. For me, when looking at tree growth, one model is better than another when it provides a better prediction for tree growth over time. For example, my most basic model assumes that a tree grows at the same rate every year. It's constant growth, we call it. In data, we see that trees grow at different rates over the course of their lives, and there's actually a pattern that relates the tree's rate of growth to the size. So if I have another model which incorporates some sort of size behavior, it's going to be better than my model which just assumes this constant growth rate. There are a bunch of moving parts here for any modeling system. The easiest bit to work with is the maths, so this model over here. That can lead to pathological situations where people get so bound up in pushing around the maths that they lose track of data or the real world in its entirety. This is actually what happened in string theory, because aside from a couple of early successes with known problems, the field of string theory has actually failed to produce any new physics. It's produced a lot of really interesting maths though, because the physicists in the field got distracted by working on the maths and lost track of the physics. These are not the same things. Oh, so it's like getting lost online. But a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then people lose their jobs because they're not string theorists when string theory is the big thing. There was, like, <laughs> it was a whole thing. Arguably, only now, after like 30 years of this, is there actually like institutional change in the field of high energy physics. I mean, as a good mouse, I must respect a purge. <laughs> The disconnect between model and real world can happen in other ways too. If you have somebody really dedicated to a model or a way of modeling, they can try to force a system to fit a model instead of the other way around, which is how it actually should happen. My most hated examples of this come from the field of socio-physical modeling, which is a bunch of physicists, computer scientists, and occasionally mathematicians who think that they can do social science. Their models are garbage because they simplify to the point of absurdity or just wholeheartedly ignore known social structures because they're too hard and don't fit their models. One example, uh, and this is a very real example from an actual PhD project, was representing ideologies as numbers between minus one and one. <laughs> this was defended by claiming that the number represents agreement or disagreement with an ideology or an ideological statement. But that's not all ideologies are. Ideologies also aren't static over time. And that's also not straightforward, because I would argue you cannot straightforwardly measure agreement and disagreement with a statement. Because you can't say you half agree with something or fully agree with something and expect that to mean the same thing as somebody else saying they half agree with it or fully agree with it. I've also seen someone use an epidemiological model for infectious diseases in an effort to model alcoholism. This is slightly backwards because being an alcoholic is not a transmissible disease. And in fact, being isolated from other people may make one more inclined to problem drinking. We know so much 
about how alcoholism manifests in the real world, but it's messy and it's hard and it doesn't fit this nice mathematical model. So that just kind of got ignored. This field also rarely, if ever, uses real-world data. They will, if they bother to, simulate instead, because it turns out that there just isn't real-world data which behaves like their models, which should fucking tell you something. <laughs> they also tend to be willfully ignorant of actual social theory. They do not collaborate with anybody who knows what they're doing in social science because these people immediately go, your models are wrong. You have no data. You can't do this. And that just, you know, that's depressing. That's bad vibes. So they don't work with it. It's so bad. And I, I consider like this kind of sociophysical modeling stuff to be emblematic of the worst stem bro bullshit you can imagine. I don't know. There's always evol evolutionary psychology. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, no, no, I, I see evolutionary psychology as a similar sort of thing because they don't use mathematical models so much, but they are very dedicated to this idea that everything social is actually biological. And of course, they don't understand evolution either, but that's, a, that's another discussion. <laughs> You're not going to distract me this time. <laughs> well, it's also just plainly disproven by the fact that different cultures have different, yeah. mostly gender it comes down to, right? Gender roles? Well, not, not just that. Well, most of what evolutionary psychology is, it tends to be gender roles or race. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> what they propose is that there is fundamentally a biologically a biological evolution that is behind every social structure, which I, I would love to see just one of them explain how that works in terms of genetics, because they can't. <laughs> because that I don't mean that like... That's not just a trite way to say it. They, they cannot explain where you get these genetic segments that code for proteins, which is what genetics does directly, how that would actually give you social structure, because it doesn't work like that. And they are also, like, they just do not accept that you can have other types of evolution. So when I say social evolution, I do not mean oh, some, some societies are more evolved than others or any bullshit like that, because that's also not how biological evolution works. I mean change in social structures over time in response to pressure, different pressures within those societies and different needs and resource availability and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So that can happen in social structure without biology being involved, aside from like the structures that it puts on human physiology. As I said, they do not understand like evolution, from a biological standpoint, and they certainly do not understand how social evolution works. <laughs> so in terms of our diagram, what's going on here? I'm going to talk about like socio-physical modeling, but you could apply similar ideas to evolutionary psychology. So you have your real world, you have your data, and you have your model. There's just a whole bunch of kind of question marks here, really. If the data exists, I'm going to put maybe, <laughs> and simulated here, right? So there is no connection between their data and the real world. There's probably not a great connection between data and the model, if they have bothered to have the data. And all they're doing is they're fucking around on this end. They're, they have models, and they just kind of poke them and see what they do, and they write papers about it, and they refer to each other. But they're not doing science. They're just kind of navel-gazing and annoying me, personally. This is an attack on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really bad science. And if you happen to be listening to this and guiltily tugging at your collar because it sounds like something you do, it's time for you to reach out to those who deal with real-world messiness and data. If you're somebody in socio-physical modeling, go and talk to a sociologist about your problem. There may be something salvageable in what you're doing, but until you actually deal with the real world in all its fuckery, you can't claim to be doing anything worthwhile. I'm sorry. All right. I am off my soapbox now. <laughs> that is the episode. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble, Bart. Thank you as ever for having me. I will see you next time. See you then.